hear the words of the Holy Spirit, but have you hear in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So there are certain stories in the thought in the Bible that I find troubling. The story of Hagar, Abraham's sex slave, and her son, Ishmael, being thrown out into the desert to die. That, that, and seemingly God agreed to it. That's a troubling story. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Abraham going up on a mountain to kill his son and sacrifice him. That, that was troubling and problematic. And this is another one. The, I find the reaction of Jesus to this woman troubling. This, this isn't the Jesus I picture. He's not the Jesus that I know and love. Um, it kind of shakes up my view of now, uh, now, granted, she's following him around and screaming. And she's not being quiet, and she's getting louder and louder, and she won't go away. And at least she annoyed the disciples. She's causing a ruckus. That's true. But um, first he ignores her. Then he calls her a bad name. There's a, there's a perfectly good English word for dog, and dog isn't it. And I'm not going to say that word because you'd all be so wrapped up in me using that word in church you wouldn't hear the sermon. It's a bad word. It starts with a B. I'm not going to end it for you. That's, that's what he calls her. It, it, um, it's a, he says something really bad to her. And then they get into an argument. Um, that's just not this nice, kind, healing, loving, feeding, teaching Jesus I know. What is going on here? I read that story and I think, what the what? What went on there? He's having a very ungospel movement moment. <laughs> so I, you know, have struggled with this scripture, which is what we're called to do, is struggle with troublesome scriptures until they bless us. And um, and different commentators, different people who have studied, have looked at this and interpreted it in different ways. One said he got caught with caught with his compassion down. Hmm. Like, have you ever had your internet go down? <laughs> like it's something you're plugged into, and when it goes down, you really can't function. It's really. That's what we think is going on here? No, I don't find that compelling. I don't even find that intellectually cohesive. I'm sorry to whichever commentator I'm slamming. Because Jesus doesn't have compassion. He is compassion. He is the incarnate God. The very act of becoming incarnate is a compassionate act. He's God. He is love. He's not like us. We have to plug in. We could possibly have a day when we didn't work so well. But he is God. He doesn't have to plug into God. He is God. That's what incarnation is. So I'm not finding that argument very good. Another view um, says that in his response, he's just acting out of the social stereotypes of his day. This is a woman. Well, that's pretty bad, isn't it? She's a Canaanite, a Gentile. Canaanites are the people that the Jews threw out of the promised land when they came in. So she's a Canaanite. She's uh, a part of a culture that worships Baal, which does human sacrifice, and even human sacrifice of infants. She's from a vile religion, a bad culture, a people who <coughs> the Hebrews had displaced. So people say he was um, acting 
are the stereotypes that this woman should not have been there, even been there, much less shouting and disrupting. That's not ladylike. And she doesn't belong. She's an other. Again, I don't find that intellectually compelling. This is a man who spoke truth to authority over and over and over. He partied so much they thought he was a drunk. He made water and wine. He hung out with all the wrong people and loved all the wrong people. Matthew himself was a tax collector, one of the biggest sinners of the sinful in that culture who's writing this gospel, who is from Jesus' inner circle. And it completely ignores the fact that his early life was spent as a refugee child, a foreign national, in a multicultural society. When they ran from Herod and they went to Egypt, probably illegal. So, again, not compelling that he was driven by the social ideas of his time. I'll get rid of what it is in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to check all the boxes here. Um, some people say that his view of his mission grew, and that this is a pivotal point when he realizes, wait, yes, I am called to the Gentiles. Hmm, maybe. You know, he wasn't born to know how to walk or talk. He followed the human path, so it's quite mm -hmm. possible that his understanding of what he was doing grew as he went along. Certainly, this is a pivotal time in that, as was his argument with his mother over turning water into wine, when he said, woman, it is not my time. And this time he calls her, the woman, a name. Two people, by the way, one argument with Jesus. And both of them were women. So. <laughs> we like it. So if that's possible, if that's, but it doesn't explain the calling him a bad, her a bad name. I have a perspective, and it it's, might be my own. I'm not sure. And it's this. All of these are based on the idea that Jesus was somewhat caught off guard by this woman and her behavior. And that he had to kind of come around and work with it. But I think, what if we turn that idea on its head? What if we reverse our idea of how, why he's behaving because of unguardedness. What if we say that he's acting not out of unguarded moment, but purposefully, even thoughtfully? If we say that, it reminds us of a couple of things about discipleship. So let's follow that thread and see where it takes us. Matthew has just told us about a conversation that Jesus had with the crowd about defilement. And we see in this pericope, this section of the gospel, what we so often see in the gospels, where they talk about a point, and then here comes somebody, and they live the point. Happens over and over that those two are paired in the gospel. They'll tell a point, and then here comes a character to, to show that point. So if that happened here, defilement, is what Jesus was talking about. Defilement, and he was saying what goes in your mouth does not defile. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles. Personally, my age, I'm glad to know that what goes into my mouth doesn't defile. Finally, <laughs> I've earned the right. right. But what comes out defiles. And all those things he names, murder, fornication, adultery, slander, false witness, all of those things that he names affect the people around you with your words and actions. So a defiling word resonates among the community where it happens. A blessing word resonates 
among the community where it happens. And I know all of us can probably think of a time when someone said something to us and it made all the difference. And we carry it in our hearts and we're blessed by it for years. And all of us can probably think of a time when someone said something that devastated us and carry it in our hearts for years. Because what comes out of your mouth blesses or defiles. I remember, and it kind of fits in this story of the Canaanite woman, I remember one time when Medi Rivera said something to me that blesses me to this day. And Nettie was the bishop who ordained me, who priested me, and made me a deacon too. But, um, and I transferred into the Diocese of Olympia from the Diocese of Dallas. And Dallas messed up that transfer. So all of a sudden, here I am trying to set my ordination date, and maybe I'm not a candidate of either place. Maybe I'm not going to get ordained because Dallas messed up which wasn't in common for Dallas. <laughs> so why did I transfer? And I was talking to Nettie about it. I was upset, of course, and you know we were in dialogue often in those days, and she said, just remember, just remember, nothing is lost in God's economy, not even you. To this day, I carry that. And this Canaanite woman is a, is an example of that. She comes along and she lives what Jesus is talking about. The more turbulent interaction brings attention to the fact that her faith is a deep and abiding faith. What if Jesus acted purposefully in order to draw the very responses that he got from her? What if he saw her knew her as he knew so many people, basically on sight, and knew that his interchange with her would elicit responses that everybody around them could see and believe in. What does he accomplish for her and for the people around him if he ignores her? For her, if he had not ignored her, would she have shouted louder? Would she have engaged more fully? She didn't walk away. She kept it up, even when he ignored her. This woman who is already too bold and too loud got older and louder. What does he accomplish for her if he insults her and argues with her? When he does that, she turns the other cheek. She loves her enemy. She kneels before him and cries out with the wish of her deepest heart. She has already called him son of David. That's a messianic term in Matthew, coming from a Canaanite woman. And all the people around saw that response, saw her faithfulness to the path of peace and love, saw her faithfulness to claim her part in the, her participation in God's reign. What if Jesus knew that would happen and it would be an example of what he had just said? Because what she said and what she did resonated in her community and resonated in ours. And all the Christian groups who have heard this story from her time to ours Talk about a word going out. Talk about a blessing that ripples through a community. Even the dogs that eat the crumb, even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's hand. She says, can you hear the silence? The follow that statement? A woman who had every every um, initiative, every spark, every stimulus to react differently, reacted that way. And it causes Jesus to 
say to her what I believe he may have known the minute he saw her. Woman, your faith is great. The only person in Matthew to ever have that said to him. Our Jesus. I'm not, I don't think he was reacting without purpose. I think he was doing something. <clears throat> And it reminds us of a couple of things that we need to remember as disciples. One is that being a disciple of Jesus, following Jesus, means that sometimes we are formed in chaos and turbulence. It is not all sweetness and light. Sometimes it is turbulent, chaotic. Sometimes we have to speak and then speak again and then speak again, and then throw ourselves on God. That's the way of a disciple at times. It's an important thing to understand. And the other is that our community, our love for each other, arises out of that power and that compassion that Jesus speaks to her. She ends up living what Isaiah said. Soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and don't profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Jesus spoke about defilement and then he acted in a way that shows that what came from her heart was pure and good. I think it might be that he knew what was going on the whole time, that he was not having a momentary lapse, that it suited perfectly the call she needed to draw forth her face and faith and to change her and us forever. This story reminds us that the faith of our hearts is formed in all times, and that there will be times when that feels rough. Belonging to Jesus is not all sweetness and light. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, says the author 